So many issues raised uh, all together there. We'll move to questions, but first I'd just like to say a very big thank you to our sponsors, Frederick Nauman Stiftung and the Asia Foundation for their support for this uh, forum and drawing together this incredible panel. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll um, move to questions. I have a number myself, but I might uh, keep those for a, a bit later if uh, we can... Uh, perhaps uh, open it up to the floor. Uh, first of all, let me congratulate uh, the organizers for a very, very interesting substantive panel. Uh, it was fascinating, and I think we all learned a tremendous amount. I was going to ask, uh, and ask anyone actually, uh, about the role of the external sector international trade agreements, where you see uh, the role of uh, uh, international uh, uh, agreements fitting into driving the domestic change that you're talking about. Thailand is uh, involved in uh, uh, a number, and RCEP uh, is not involved in TPP, which is having its own struggles right now. But where you see, can this be a driver for some of the change that you've been suggesting? Well, you know, in, in my in my view, I I would think the you know the ASEAN Economic Community um, will provide an impetus, an impetus for change, but we will probably not see that by the end of this year. Um, you know, many of the actions have started, but um, the, all the goals have not been met yet, especially in the services um, liberalization uh, you know, sector. But without the AEC, I would not have seen, you know, ASEAN countries reduce, you know, their barriers to services trade. So, you know, the AEC has indeed provided, you know, a start to, um, you know, ASEAN countries reducing their barriers to services trade. Although, as I said, by the end of the year, we'll probably not see big changes yet. Um, we will probably see it you know, in, the up, in the upcoming maybe three to five years. But in terms of the, of the goods trade, you know, we've made quite a bit of progress there. Tariffs have been reduced to zero since 2010 for the six original ASEAN countries. And by the end of this year, the four new members, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam, will reduce their tariffs to zero as well. So, in terms of um, you know, import tariffs, you know we've made quite a bit of progress. But of course, you know we will have you know the remaining problem of uh, non-tariff barriers that have you know uh, been high and it's still high in, in, in within ASEAN countries as well. So. There are still, you know, more things to be done, but I would say it's a good start for the ASEAN. I think because it's a military government, nobody is negotiating with us at the moment. But nevertheless, uh, there's something that's going on. I think it's the Thailand EU is certainly uh, waiting, you know, uh, and I, and but the Thailand US is, has been quiet for a long time. But I heard that uh, the US president just got fast track from the uh, from the Congress, which means the U.S. may become more active in negotiating again. And to my uh, my past work in FTA, I realized that to drive liberalization in Thailand, we have to negotiate with, with the countries like the U.S. or the EU. Because um, negotiation within ASEAN among themselves, ASEAN, I, I think, except for Singapore, no other ASEAN wants to liberalize their own service sector. And because nobody wants to liberalize, nobody is pushing each other to liberalize, except for Singapore. And so I think ASEAN will take a long time to actually open up its service sector. ASEAN has achieved a lot in manufacturing, but I'm afraid that in services it's going to be a difficult issue, and it's going to take a very long time. But uh, bilateral with the EU, bilateral with the US, I think it can really push of Thailand economy forward a lot, quite a lot. Because there's much to be hand, there's carrot and stick. There is much that Thailand can gain from the EU, from the US, because it's our major exporting destinations. So there's a lot that then can be quid pro quo. 
But among us and ourselves, there's not much quid pro quo. So it's the negotiation is a little bit stagnant. So I look forward that you know once we start negotiating again, there might be the, we can use this platform as as uh, for 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 structural change in Thailand. Thank you. I, I know, Dr. Pavita, you want to say something as well? Yes, uh, the moderator said to be brief. <laughs> and, uh, and I would like to take perhaps a different hat coming from business school, and I think I would like to answer your question more from the firm perspective. I think uh, all these regional agreements as well as international agreements do provide benefits uh, on the firm's level in the sense that it provides access to market if the agreements allow that to happen. But as we know that most agreements uh, are looking for opening up market in services here and then protecting the market that Thailand needs to access. So, but that is one thing. But I think uh, another issue is that I think firms are already doing what needs to be done regardless of uh, agreements. And this is particularly true in the regional uh, AEC. I think that uh, a lot of Thai firms have recognized the potential in, in ASEAN without the success of AEC being officially launched. So uh, when we look at all these agreements, perhaps uh, it's nice to have the photo ops of uh, government saying that we have concluded this and that. But I think on the ground, a lot of firms are doing a lot of things. And many firms even think that uh, the rules and regulations are sort of irrelevant to what they need to be doing or sometimes it's the obstacle of doing more things that they already want to do. Can I just follow up on that and say that uh, it's, it's pretty fashionable to scoff at all the agreements that are being made for AEC, for example, if there are hundreds, but do companies really set store by these things like the non-tariff measures that are now being negotiated? I mean, surely that will be a big factor in boosting intra-regional trade, if not trade beyond the region. Certainly, you know, for trade, it, it helps to, to reduce all the barriers. But I think for key strategic decisions, uh, it does help to, to, to open up opportunities in the region. But I think when firms come to think of what they want to do to benefit their strategy, and uh, regional agreements would be one thing. And I think it would not be right to have those things to, to persuade firms. I, I, I tend to believe that let the firms decide what is best for them, and then you provide all the environment for them to, to benefit from a freer and a more competitive environment. And do not use all this agreement to direct uh, rules and regulations. So I tend not to think that it's the job of the government to say that here we have AEC, so let's try to push firms to, to, do, to invest more in this area. But if all kind of agreements that open up opportunities, people would see opportunities and they would grab it right. as they see fit. Okay, so you're saying the market, uh, the free market works. <laughs> just, just to they say thank you very much and some very interesting um, uh, proposals there. And subject to what's just been said about the private sector going ahead and being very active and, and doing what it's going to do anyway, um, what I wanted to ask is how do we get from here to there? Because have you got the right economic decision-making structures in place? Thailand's going through a period of reform. You've got a lot of bodies involved in that. You've got five rivers. You've got a, a reform here, reform there, reform all over. How do you bring it together so we've got a clear strategy and a clear economic decision-making structure. And what would you change at the moment? Because um, I I'd welcome uh, a bit more clarity on how you see policy being made at the moment on the economy and how this strategic approach would evolve. Thank you. Actually, it's one of the recommendations I was going to mention later, but since you brought it up, um, I think the role of the government would have to change. And I don't mean just this government or any particular government. But I think in the past, we have a pretty directive role of the government. Um, and, and I'll cite some examples later. But I think going forward, we need a more facilitative role. As uh, Dr. Pavida was saying, the firms know what they want to do. Um, so. Um, facilitate that. And I think the government needs to just go back to their basic public finance textbook, right? And what do they need to do? They need to provide things that are public goods. 
they need to provide infrastructure, no one else is going to do that. But other things, um, for example, education. I think that's one of the areas where we were talking about. We need more engineers. Uh, Dr. Dinden was saying we need more engineers, we need more technicians. One time I was at a seminar, I think it was a TDRI seminar maybe, or Bank of Thailand seminar, and they invited, must be TDRI, um, invited a, a former minister of, Fine, um, of education to come in and then he was talking about yes we're going to change that we're going to promote more vocational schools and from now on we're going to have a 50 50 percent of uh, uh, high school graduates going into vocational and the other half going into university education and i started to wonder like why is it not 45 55 why is it not 30 70 how would the government sector know what the right numbers are, right? And I think that's part of the problem, is that they think they know. But from past experience, the Thai government, and I think all governments, tend to be too slow in their decision making, um, and they don't really understand the private sector. And I think that's the case for the Bank of Thailand too. But, uh, and I think it's more like if they recognize that something has positive externalities, for example, education, give subsidy. There are large firms. When you, you, you look at the, the Thai educational system, you also see that there are some big corporates that finance their own training and send people to college and do the upgrading. Smaller firms are not doing that. Why? I mean, it's easy. Large firms, they probably have enough, um, you know, branches, CP branches or whatever all over the country that when they do the investment, it pays back. For smaller firms, who wants to do the training? You train them, they're gone. People are gone. I mean, employees are gone. So you need subsidy for firms led. You know, I, I think there needs to be more like private and public partnership in these areas where the private sector uh, engage in the decision making but the government allows certain tax and subsidies to align the, the well internalize the the positive and the negative externalities that, that, that go on and by that I don't mean the farm subsidies though I think that generates no externalities so <laughs> it doesn't, yeah. so, so I think that that's the, the the role of the government that I I wish to see uh, going forward um, I think we cannot expect much if uh, under the current political instability with political instability the government will not think long term they'll think very short term I think we in our in that uh, conference that Dr. Rung mentioned we concluded there were seven ministers in four years, seven ministers of education in four years. There's no way we can carry out education policy with seven ministers in four years. So I, I think that, as, as I think the first thing is to, to get political stability. And once you get political stability, then we can really start thinking. But it should not be that way. And But it should not be in that way in that long-term policy should be promoted by the, bureau, the, the bureaucracy, should have their idea in hand and they hand it to the politician but in Thailand is the other way around the bureaucracy has nothing the political came I want this and they disappeared in one year and then the new government came and said I want the other way so I think we know that there's a swinging and nobody knows what where, where we're going we change direction every time there's a change in government and I think our Thailand's key challenge is how can we build the capability of Thai bureaucracy so that they have a very good plan and that is continuous and not swing by political whim at political whims. Right. Could, could I just follow up there and say that your point about the seven education ministers in four years, and we've seen it with, well, also with prime ministers and other many other sorts of ministers, but is there an issue here with how authoritative any minister really is? In you've got some very good ones, but you've also had a lot of succession of very political appointments. And what are we seeing now, for example? Uh, it's it's very fluid at the moment where mm. we're going, but just the demonstration. Actually, it's the seven in seven minister in four. I think it's the most, the one that's no. has been changed the most because nobody can deliver, and <laughs> education is always on the top priority of every government, and nobody can deliver. And when they don't deliver, they just change and they keep changing. And uh, I think recently, because of political stability, I would say the quality of the ministers in Thailand has gone down tremendously. I'd be very honest. Before, person who's going to take the portfolio of Minister of Finance, regardless of any 
party, it will have to be a very high caliber. But now, I'm not saying about this current minister, but in the past, I mean, you can have minister of finance who knows nothing about finance, you know, and so the quality of minister has gone down a lot, and and this is a big big challenge for Thailand. Yes, uh, Dr. Pavega. Can I say something just very short? But uh, just to highlight your point, uh, I am from the business school. The undergrad that I uh, produce at my school, starting salaries is. Uh, 19,000 per month uh, minimum. Uh, for government job, uh, starting salary for undergrads, it's, uh, I believe it's uh, 8,000 to 9,000 or something. So with that, it's just uh, you cannot have the strong bureaucracy when the, when the pay is, is not there. And I think that one of the threats for Thailand is that the bureaucracy is not leading the country, as the Dr. Dian Dian said. And then uh, when the breast the best brain go into the private sector and then it's uh, more dangerous that way because it's not always in the best interest of the country. Yeah. Great presentations, but most of you touched on the problem of low wage. What was absent was Thai's economic model is low wage, high profit. And the companies have profited. I mean, if you look at the number of Rolls Royces that were sold last year, the the high number of Mercedes Benz that are selling apartments going for $2 million down the road. Uh, clearly, some people have benefited from this economy. And my question is, are the captains of these companies quite happy to profit from the high profit, low wage model and continue with this problem that most of you have highlighted needs to change? Thanks. Uh, an economy which exports 70% of its GDP, 10% of which is services, has, uh, by definition, an extremely strong private sector. And so uh, this private sector could not be as strong as it is uh, if the government was meddling too much. So probably the government is not meddling too much, and that is an enormous virtue. So yes, I heard maybe Pavida talking about being led by the bureaucracy. Uh, I know we have lots of examples around us of economies led by the bureaucracy. But uh, I'm not sure, uh, given the average quality of your bureaucracy, as you yourselves uh, acknowledged, uh, whether it would be a good idea to, 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 to allow the bureaucracy to have a, a, a stronger role in leading the economy. Uh, the private sector has been doing a remarkable work, and you have a fantastic economy uh, with no unemployment, uh, with the, 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 macro, uh, uh, the macro balance is basically very virtuous, and uh, so I, I, I would look preferably and preferentially to the, to the private sector itself and try to find there where are the strengths and the weaknesses and I would interloc interlocute with them basically, not so much with government because you, you, you quite obviously have a political governance problem in Thailand, so which might take a long time to solve. Uh, so maybe the economy should not be made so much dependent on the solution of your political governance problem and we should instead look at your private sector and work with your private sector, I mean you, I mean you, the institutions which are represented there on the table, uh, because you do have a fantastic private sector. It's a private sector with results which are uh, the object of envy of a vast majority of countries in the world. Right. I, I would like just to add something else. On the question of, of, of the mid Lincoln trap, uh, I was expecting to hear more this morning about the, what was mentioned, uh, I think it was by Pavida, uh, the, 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 no, it was by the last speaker, um, the problem of uh, the lack of, 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 of freedom in services in Thailand, because that seems to be the heart of the middle income trap, not only here, but in so many other places. Uh, and that, that issue was not sufficiently developed this morning. I think it should have been developed more. And I hope that in other fora, 
uh, devoted to the same to the same subject that this issue is more dwelt into because I think that is the heart of the of the of the of the problem of the um, let's say under development of, of of the economy I mean the insatisfaction that you all seem to share with uh, the way the economy has been going in the past few years let me just pitch in a few questions and then we'll leave it to the speakers to address you don't have to address all of them and not all of you have to to speak uh, uh, per question uh, I think uh, no one on the panel works for the government uh, because you've been very independent, very critical, uh, and, and thank you for being here today. Uh, one of the slides that uh, Dr. Rung put up uh, is about trend growth. So trend growth from six to eight, you know, down to about three to four, maybe even lower uh, in in an, in a near, in a medium term. Um, so this is attributable partly to the the decade long political conflict crisis we've had. So I have three, just three quick questions. The first issue, I think, in the interim. The interim period, which is going to take, Dr. Linden mentioned political instability. In fact, now it's stable. It's stable, but it's not predictable. Um, we don't. We want political regularity, uh, expectability, predictability. Uh, we don't know what will happen in the next six months, two years, three years. The interim can be a very long time. So one issue for us is, you know, what should they do? What should we do? What should the government do um, in the interim period, which could be two to three years? And they've made it clear that they will be around for a while, and there's nothing that you or I or anyone can do about it. Um, so, what should they be thinking about? You know, they they've exhibited different signs: thinking long term, doing short term things, a bit uh, convoluted, really. Uh, so, perhaps we could uh, just maybe set uh, some parameters that maybe they can think about. Second, uh, is the middle income trap as bad as? People make it out to be. I mean, it's you know, so five thousand three hundred seventy dollars. This is the upper middle middle income range, uh, but we have high inequality in Thailand, as it's been noted. Uh, so if you spend longer time in the middle income space uh, and address the distributional issues, would that be better than rushing it, rushing out of the middle income into what? Into the high income? Um, and you look at the high income countries, they have a lot of problems. Uh, the third, I, I want to really uh, ask the speaker, especially the uh, conventional view of the aging society, you know, all societies age. Uh, but is this overstated for Thailand? I mean, is Thailand really facing an aging population crisis? Uh, we have five million people coming from uh, working in Thailand from Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, three million plus Myanmar and the rest are Laos and Cambodia. And the Cambodians are very young and they're all young. They're all pretty young. So in the, in the workforce of 39 million, you add in this uh, uh, additional migrant laborers, uh, would that alleviate some of the pressure on the, the demographics of the workforce? Um, I also looked at the UN population uh, data. You know, in the year 2020, most Thai people would still be under, uh, no, not all, and under 60. I think if you look at the the, the, the categories, uh, it's not at all anywhere near the, the Japanese or even other countries with aging problems. Uh, and finally, this relates to the uh, locational uh, advantage. Uh, it's been said, and I think it's true, that you know Thailand is, has a good location. So with this strategic location being in the middle of uh, mainland Southeast Asia, with the CLMTV countries rising, the GMS and so on, would this allow Thailand to buy some time and to still maintain a trend growth uh, of 3 to 4 percent, regardless of the political instability and volatility? This high profit, low wage model that you know, Thailand has been using for a long time, and, and we know, you know from our presentations today that this can't last because low wages are you know not going to be around as i showed in some of my graphs that actually wages in thailand has you know been been rising um, even faster than labor productivity so this is not going to to last but you know while it lasts you know we see um you know those who are able to capture you know most of the rents from from this model have done so which is why we've seen thailand's income inequality being quite high, and it's been remained, it has remained high for the last um, 20 plus years, although it has declined a little bit. So I, I, would, I would think you know, this model um, 
would not be sustained, and um, which is why we have this discussion today on how can we move up the the value chain. Because at you know at the end of the day, we would probably have to compete with you know countries with lower wages and more abundant labor supply. So you know to also answer Dr. Titinan's question on um, on this issue of aging and and, and migrants, you know I, I would say that migrants. Um, if they are, you know, coming from Laos, Cambodia, or or Myanmar, I usually, you know, lower skills. So, you know, they might be able to sustain this low wage model for a while longer, but maybe that's not the way we want to go because there will be other countries that will compete in this low in this low wage, you know, activities, um, you know, with with Thailand as well. So, you know, I would rather say if we were to, you know, to alleviate this aging issue in Thailand. Maybe it's better to try to open up, um, you know, for migrants who are more skilled, for doctors, nurses, you know, or engineers, you know, from from other countries in the world, so that if we would like to be a medical hub, and as Dr. Duen Din says, you know, it needs a lot of doctors, and at the moment we're pulling doctors from the rural areas of Thailand, you know, into Bamrung Rad and Bangkok hospitals, right? But if we open up and attract, you know, highly qualified doctors and nurses from, let's say, the Philippines or overseas, you know, that would actually help, you know, Thailand become a hub. But at the same time, not, you know, um, pull doctors from the rural areas as well. So, so I would, I would think, um, you know, it, it, you know, an age, the aging problem is there, is there definitely, um, but it probably can be alleviated at least in the in the short run by attracting, you know, talent into Thailand, so that would be. Thank you very much. Now, I think uh, we, we are running out of time, so I'll, I'll actually seize on um, uh, Dr. Titinan's first question, which is um, about uh, reminding us that uh, we seem to have a slightly indefinite uh, time frame here for this uh, current uh, government, and maybe uh, your, the panelists would like to venture at policy prescriptions of what you think um, could be, you know, some of the priority uh, strategies the government uh, should pursue. I thought you, you've all raised some very good points, uh, including this issue of, um, you know, the appointments of ministers, the, you know, education, etc. A lot of these are longer term, but we're looking at a an issue right now and a fairly limited time frame with Thailand's economy somewhat flailing. So perhaps if I could. Ask each of you to run through very quickly, um, and maybe uh, with you, Dr. Rung, first. And this is my personal view, though. Uh, if I were the government, the present government, and dealing with you know a lot of unpredictable political scenarios and things like that, I think, first of all, I would, if I could put it in Thai, tam jai means you just sort of accept the fact and sort of realize that the GDP figures are not going to be that great. It cannot be that great under the present situation. And we don't mean just the political factors uh, weighing on this. It also means the structural stuff that we have been talking about. If I were the government, I would concentrate on one thing that I think would at least be in the right direction, whether you want to go and become like what Dr. Dindin said, a, a mega manufacturing base or a knowledge base economy. I think one thing that we need to work on is that in this economy, knowledge has to flourish, innovation has to flourish, and the only way you can make that flourish is to make sure that it pays to get the knowledge. It pays to innovate. And what stands between that and Thailand, I think, is corruption. It's actually one word that we have not been talking about. Right. If you want the economy to be knowledge-based, what else? I mean, you have to reward knowledge. You have to reward innovation. And meritocracy is the word that I think we need to work more on. And uh, so if I were the government, I think and it's not going to be finished in two years, three years, five years, probably not in 20 years. But somebody has to start that. And I think this is a good time that, that they start um, working on this. So during the interim period, I would um, work on corruption and make it very forceful, more forceful than what they have done. I think uh, they have um, made efforts, but probably it would need to be more visible. And that would definitely not just encourage Thai firms 
locally, but I think FDIs, everyone, I mean, it's going to be a paradigm shift and shifting in the right direction. Um, Dr. Chitinan was asking whether this MIT is bad. The bad MIT is actually bad. I think that the, from historical perspective, I mean, there are countries that got stuck forever there. So in some way, it's like if you don't have a paradigm shift, it could be bad. You know, I, mean, I think that, that that's what it is. And um, uh, so, and this aging society business, I, I totally agree with Dr. Girida and Dr. Din Din that, you know, even just because you have a, a, an abundance of a neighbor country's uh, labor force, it's not the way we would like to go because it would impede the longer term um, growth model that we have been uh, uh, talking about. And I think other issues arise also with this aging uh, society is that, first of all, we have to think more about the fiscal burden. There would be less room for the fiscal policy to do stuff because, I mean, with older people, you would need to address uh, their medical stuff. And I think and other issues that, you know, I mean, I, I have a lot of uh, people, I mean, uh, the central bank employs a lot of people. Um, you start to see also that uh, you need to cope with it. I mean, I have a lot of uh, younger staff who have to take care of their parents, not just that, grandparents. They might be the only grandparents for four, I mean, for four grandparents, they might be the only um, grandchild. And people tend to live longer, older. There are other social aspects that you have to think about also. And not just, you know, like high pay, retained people. And, and I think the, the, the environment, the working environment, the social environment would have to adjust accordingly with this aging society business. Thank you. Very good point, uh, which we haven't really explored today. So glad you mentioned it, uh, Dr. Kirida. I'd, I'd also like to, I wonder about the household debt, which we haven't really talked about and how much it kind of dominates a lot of the headlines. Um, I don't know if you want to... Two years ago, it was the Bank of Thailand who raised this issue about household debt. Right now, we're the only institutions that really don't talk much about household debt anymore. Why? I mean, people, you know, the, the headline figure sort of edge up, as we all know. Um, I think our key point, the, the Bank of Thailand's key point, is that two years ago, when we raised the issue that, okay, debt was rising, everyone said, it's okay. The government said, it's okay. It's a first car. It's a flood. It's, they have more debt, but they also have more assets. They have the first car as an asset, you know. They didn't realize the asset value might have gone down. Um, but, uh, and even banks were expanding, you know, credit extension. Right now, life is very different. So, so when, we, when we talk about the government is the first people who say, you know, debt is bad. And then you talk to uh, the private sector, they also say debt is bad. Uh, um, banking sector is not really extending loan because they're afraid of, you know, household debt. So it's like the, the whole psychology has already shifted. It's probably shifted by more than what the central bank had wished to, to, to see. But it wasn't just the numbers that were alarming, but it was the environment where people thought incurring debt was okay. It was that that we minded. We don't mind 80% household debt to GDP. Oh, by the way, now, now that the, the new NESDB numbers, GDP has gone up, household debt to GDP might have gone down just like that. Yeah. <laughs> no, but that, that's just the numbers. But, but I, I, I want to stress this. It, it's the environment, it's the psychology that, that nurtures the, the, the wrong kind of debt accumulation that I think we have become more sane in this whole issue of household debt and, and we're less afraid uh, of, of it being like a problem. But of course, I mean, it's, it, we're still vigilant about it. Right. Thank you. Dr. Kirida, you. your prescriptions. Short, sure. very short. Well, my prescription is probably according to what I said is on human capital development. Right. I think that is the single you know, most important factor for Thailand to achieve any of the things we said today is to have good and capable people. So I, I, would, I would think this government, if it has a chance to lay the foundation for you know, education improvements, especially 
um, at the basic education level because the, at the end of the day, it's basic education that counts because if you don't have good basic education, you can't go to vocational or higher education that is of high quality as well. So, you know, if I were the government, I would lay the foundation for a good basic education. And here again, I just, just like to point out to a, a study that the World Bank has just completed and, and will be released soon on um, how to improve the quality of schools in, in villages and towns in Thailand. Because again, you know, most of the schools in Thailand are, are owned by the, the Ministry of um, Education and they are in the towns and villages in Thailand and they're mostly small schools. So, you know, how do we improve the quality of that? And some of the things that we have recommended, you know, just quickly, Gwen, in, in this report was that because schools are so small now due to the, re uh, the, the, the reduced number of students because they were aging, but this, these schools were built, you know, 50 years ago and they still exist, it's probably time to merge them you know, with each other or with uh, larger schools nearby. Now that, you know, public infrastructure is so much better, we can provide school buses to students. So larger schools will have economies of scale and can provide better education quality, um, you know, better teachers, you know, to students. So that's probably like one, so one of the things we can do. The other one, which is um, also, um, you know, quite doable, and that's actually with the TDRI's uh, recommendation in um, their year-end conference two years ago, is to, uh, Increased accountability of schools by, you know, opening up information on school performance to parents. So parents, community would also have a say, right? So it's building up demand from the bottom as well, and not only from top down. So you know, I, I would I would think if if you know one single thing I would do if I were the government is to lay down the foundation for. Um, you know, better education and, and target it to the areas that is most needed, which are the, you know, the small uh, towns and villages. Thank you. I will be really brief, and I think that if I have to answer one of the questions as I am um, asked, uh, what should the government do or not do? I think one thing that they should not do is they should not mess the institution further. And if they can possibly do, they should strengthen the institution. And uh, by not messing up the institution, I would say that Thailand has rules and regulation and institution dealing with a lot of things. But uh, we might see the tendency of the current government to try to use extra territorial power to handle a lot of things. Article 44, to handle motorcycle race on the street and things like that. That's something that perhaps they should constrain themselves from doing further, because that's directly undermining the existing uh, institution. Right. And uh, short answer. Beautifully short, thank you. And last but not least, Dr. Dindan. Um, one thing I would say, the government will have to liberalize the service sector. Nobody has had the courage to do that. They need to liberalize key service sectors like, such as telecommunications and energy and transport. These are under the monopolies of private monopolies and public monopolies, and these are the people with Mercedes driving around. If you look at them, you ask them, they have certain kind of privilege, and that's why they're so wealthy. It's, very few of them is because of their own merit and successful business model, but most has got to do with a lot of rent that goes on in this country. Thank you very much. Well, I think we've had uh, a, a really excellent uh, uh, set of perspectives today from uh, these four excellent panelists. So I'd like to give them all a big hand and to thank our sponsors. And thank you all for coming.